Welcome to the Asia Economist, a webinar series from DBS Group Research. I'm Tamir Beg, Chief Economist. Today, we will look at Singapore's outlook for the second half of 2020. Lots going on, uh, not just the pandemic and its impact on the economy, but also an election. Uh, to talk about all that, we have with us our senior economist, Irvin Seah, who will guide us through a series of slides, after which I will entertain some questions for him. Irvin, all yours. Thank you, Tamer. Um, hi, morning, everyone. Um, well, uh, I think the last time we spoke about, you know, the uh, Singapore economy, um, that was, you know, a couple of months back uh, when the economy was really going through a difficult period uh, with the local transmission uh, rising. Um, but now I think the situation has changed. Um, the government has lifted the so-called circuit breaker um, after a, a period of about two months. Uh, that essentially marks a very important turning point in the um, economic outlook for Singapore uh, because essentially that will return economic activity to normalcy. So, well, while it brings some relief to many local companies and also hope for the financial markets, but um, I think in the next uh, you know, half an hour or so uh, in my slides, I'm going to highlight the fact that this is likely to be an uneven recovery. Um, recovery will come in different way to different companies and different industries. It will feel very differently to every Singaporean as well. Now, it all starts on the health front because if we are not able to contain the spread of the uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic, then of course we can't really talk much about you know what's going to happen on the economic front and the good news is that um, i think we are beginning to see very um, you know encouraging results on the health front um, as you can see uh, on slides two the chart on the left hand side that the total number of uh, local transmissions it, the curve seems to be suggesting that uh, is gradually flattening because if you focus on the chart on the right hand side you know on the gray line the number of daily cases is coming down, you know, in a very, very prominent way. So this is essentially implies that, you know, we are getting very good control in terms of the uh, spread of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And also, I think an important point to highlight is that in terms of number of deaths, um, Singapore j currently just registered just 26, uh, you know, uh, cases. And this in terms of per capita uh, uh, basis, this is actually, uh, you know, as a percentage of the population, this is actually one of the lowest uh, in the world. So I think credit should go to our very credible and robust health care system that we have in Singapore. Now, the ability to, uh, you know, contain the spread of the uh, COVID-19 virus is very important because this implies that the government, you know, could, you know, open up the economy and allow economic activity to resume. That being said, um, I think it's inevitable. We have mentioned this time and again in the past that this year, Singapore will experience the deepest recession since independence. Our forecast remain unchanged at minus 5.7% for the full year. Now this essentially implies that we will likely see five consecutive quarters of contraction, as you can see in this chart on slide three, right? Importantly, this also marks means that for the second quarter of this year, which is currently now, uh, sorry, I mean, we just passed the second quarter. Um, it will mark the bottom of the entire um, cycle where we expect growth to contract by 8% in the second quarter. This will mark the bottom of the cycle. This second quarter of this year will be the worst quarter. Um, and when, as we move into the third quarter, uh, since because of the lifting of the circuit breaker, we will see economic uh, stability gradually taking hold. And before we see uh, you know, some improvement towards the end of the year, and eventually for the year-on-year -year GDP growth to revert back to positive level by the second quarter of next year. However, of course, there is always a risk case. If should we see uh, you know, a spike up in the number of local uh, transmission because of the uh, you know, lifting of the circuit breaker, and that if we are not able to contain that increase in the number of local transmissions uh, to the point whereby the government is forced to reimpose the circuit breaker, then of course, you know, there is a likelihood that we will see an even deeper recession. 
our estimate is that uh, in the risk case, uh, growth could actually contract as deep as 7.8% for the full year. That being said, this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery at all. Um, our simulation suggests that you know, the current cycle in this crisis is going to last for as long as 24 months, as you can see from slides four here. Now, compared to the past two major crises that Singapore has experienced, uh, such as the global financial crisis and the Asia financial crisis, whereby the cycle lasted for about uh, 18 to 19 months, uh, in the sense that you know, the economy took about 18 to 19 months to return, in terms of real GDP, to return back to pre uh, crisis level. So for this crisis, it will take as long as 24 months for the economy in terms of real GDP to return back to pre-COVID level. So this is not going to be just an uneven recovery, but this is also going to be a long cycle, relatively longer compared to the past two major crises. But market has been very optimistic. Uh, if you look at slides five here, um, you know, we saw uh, in March a sharp drop uh, in the various uh, key asset classes in terms of uh, the sing dollar in the FX, uh, uh, you know, territory in terms of equity market and also in the yield spread. Uh, you know, there was a very drastic uh, decline in, you know, winning weeks. And as of now, um, you know, this chart is as of, um, you know, mid June. Uh, market somehow has recovered uh, on average about 70% uh, of the losses uh, in March. And uh, if you compare this across the various markets, you know, in the region on the chart on the right hand side, uh, Singapore is not doing uh, that badly. Uh, in fact, it's doing quite well. So market has been very optimistic uh, with regards to the recovery process ahead. Well, um, you know, I guess you can explain, you know, uh, by the fact that market tend to be forward looking. Uh, and usually at least about six months ahead. Um, however, uh, what will pan out in on reality may not be that optimistic as what market is suggesting. All right, we have seen recently, uh, you know, the um, equity market, uh, you know, in the U.S., you know, uh, being shaken by the fear of a second wave of infections. Um, so hopefully that will not uh, happen in Singapore. So I mentioned that in reality, things are not going to be as smoothly as what the market is suggesting. For example, uh, if you look at chart six here, um, some sectors will be, you know, worse hit compared to the others. Uh, and one of the uh, industries that have bore the brunt of this COVID-19 pandemic is none other than the tourism industry. You can see from the chart here, um, in terms of tourist arrivals, there's hardly any tourist arrival uh, you know, now because the border is still closed. And uh, in terms of uh, hotel occupancy uh, rate, it's currently hovering at about 40%. Some people may ask, you know, why isn't it uh, at zero, you know? Um, and the reason is because, um, you know, in this chart is as of uh, April. And back then, um, there are still many people uh, that are in quarantine. And the government is utilizing uh, some of the hotels for quarantine purposes. So therefore, that has sort of uh, bumped up the occupancy rate for the hotels. But by and large, you know, there's hardly any tourists at all. There's no tourists at all, in fact. Um, so I think it will take a long time, uh, short of any effective vaccinations that can be distributed to everyone around the world. Um, I think the COVID-19 pandemic is here to stay for a long time. So therefore, um, tourism or non-essential travel is not going to be the same. The government is working very hard in terms of establishing green lane and travel bubbles with some, uh, you know, uh, countries where there are significantly uh, lower level of uh, local transmissions. Um, but the focus thus far is more on just essential uh, business travel. So, uh, you know, recreational, uh, non-essential travel, I think uh, it will take a long time for that to return. So, you know, the tourism industry, you know, will have to go through a very long and painful uh, recovery process. Many of the companies may not be, be even able to survive this crisis. However, there are uh, some um, bright spark. Uh, I'll touch on that in some industries. 
Um, the retail sales and F&B industry, uh, as you can see from slide nine, uh, seven here, uh, slide seven. Um, in terms of retail sales, um, it has fallen by um, more than 40% as of uh, April. That is, you know, largely on the back of the uh, implementation of the circuit breaker. Uh, retail sales uh, plummeted, you know, quite sharply. And if you look at the chart on the right hand side, uh, the main drag came from discretionary uh, spending, such as watch watches and jewelry, department stores. Uh, however, uh, FMB was also very badly hit. You know, the decline was as much as uh, more than 80%. However, um, the supermarket sales has actually bucked the trend because people are staying home uh, and as a result, they are not going out to dine and henceforth more cooking and hence more, henceforth more grocery shoppings. So, uh, you know, supermarkets definitely has benefited from the uh, circuit breaker. But with the circuit breaker being lifted, um, if you look at slides eight here, we have seen uh, a sharp increase in terms of human traffic flows. The six charts here shows you the uh, Google Mobility reports from various categories. Uh, and you can see, especially on retail and the recreational, the number of, uh, you know, the human traffic flow has actually picked up quite dramatically. Uh, in the uh, transport transit stations as well, uh, and also in workplace. All these are showing that uh, with the lifting of the circuit breaker, uh, you know, people are going out more, and obviously that will, uh, you know, stock well for the um, retail sector as, as well as the F&B industry. And there are industry that has been the outperformer thus far, and one of these industry is the manufacturing sector. Uh, the chart on uh, this slides, uh, the charts in slides nine here uh, shows you that. And if you focus on the chart on the left hand side, the PMI figures uh, is showing some picked up as of May. Um, but that being said, we have also seen some pullback in the uh, industrial production figure and the non oil domestic uh, exports figure. If you focus on the chart on the right hand side, there is a pullback uh, in May. It is largely, uh, you know, attributed to a pullback in pharmaceutical uh, exports and productions. Now, the pharmaceutical industry is a very peculiar industry. Uh, it has benefited tremendously from the uh, increase, its spike up in demands for drugs uh, in early part of the year uh, because of the pandemic. And Singapore is a very key uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients production hubs uh, globally. So that obviously, you know, pharmaceutical industry has benefited uh, from the increased demand from the pandemic. But this industry is also a very volatile industry. So usually after a few months of, uh, you know, ramp up in productions, um, you know, factories have to shut down to sterilize their production lines and equipment before they embark uh, on the next batch of uh, drugs. This is to prevent contaminations uh, between different batches of drugs. So there is a very peculiar nature of this particular industry. So we have seen this pullback in May. Hopefully, June figure, we'll see a pickup again. But that being said, I think the pickup going forward is likely to be weaker. I think the uh, numbers may actually run sideways and bias a little bit on the downside because at the end of the day, the global economy is in recession uh, and also you know, the electronics industry, which has benefited from the stay home phenomenon in early part of year now could actually see some easing off, uh, you know, as uh, countries around the world starts to, you know, open up from uh, or leave their lockdown and people start to return to work. So therefore, that essentially implies that, you know, the stay home phenomenon in terms of a pickup in demands for electronics gadget may wane uh, in the coming months. Overall, this is going to be a, an uneven recovery as I highlighted because it will impact different industry very differently. This is our simulation forecast uh, outcome. So you can see very clearly that the tourism uh, in this instance, the hotel and restaurant sector will be the worst hit. Uh, construction sector has been uh, badly affected also because of the significantly large number of uh, you know, uh, foreign workers that has been infected in the dormitories. Uh, and while the government continue to test, uh, you know, the uh, workers in the dormitories and hopefully to return them back to the workplace. There will still be safe measures being put in place, which will hamper uh, the progress of the construction activity. Transport uh, 
industry is also badly impacted, mainly the main drags coming from the aviation industry. Wholesale and retail trade, we talked about it just now, uh, and hopefully in the coming months, we will see improvement. Some of the outperformer will include financial services, manufacturing, and of course, the ICT. And I mentioned that the recovery will be uneven across sectors. It will also uh, be very different uh, on how it will uh, impact the labor market. In fact, while we see improvement in growth, that does not necessarily imply that we will see immediate improvement in the labor market. The reason is simple, because right now, the government has put forth very strong uh, support measures you know, to prevent job losses. And one of the key trusts is the job support scheme, whereby the government subsidized as much as 75% uh, of the first 4,600 of wages of local workers. That may expire uh, in the months ahead. So while it has managed to prevent uh, job losses, I think we have not seen the worst of the labor market yet. So when those policy support measures expire, um, you know, towards the later part of the year, I think some companies may have to realign their um, headcount uh, requirement with, uh, you know, a new level of revenues because revenues earnings may, no, may not be the same as what it used to be uh, you know, compared to the pre-COVID levels. So if, if there's going to be permanent loss in earnings, some companies may have to let go some workers, uh, especially when the support measures expire. So we could see actually, you know, a higher number of unemployment going forward. And henceforth, you know, there's this lag effect uh, between growth and the labor market. Typically, the lag effect is about one to two quarter. Also, even if we see recovery, even if growth picked up, I think hiring managers will uh, want to ensure that, you know, the future earnings is secure before they start to add on new headcounts. So the recovery in the labor market is likely to be slower than the growth cycle. So we mentioned that we expect more higher uh, number of unemployment going forward. If you look at slides 12 here, um, by the end of the year, uh, we expect uh, roughly about 100 uh, resident workers will be unemployed. This will bring the overall uh, resident unemployment rate up to 4.2%. And if you add on the foreign workers component, uh, we could see as many as 135,000 workers unemployed by the end of the year. And also, the recovery may affect um, you know, people uh, in different ways. Um, and I mean, different people will feel it very differently. Uh, if you look at slide 13 here, um, slides that didn't show what happened during the global financial crisis period. And it is quite clear on this chart that the low income has actually been the one that bore the brunt of the fallout in the labor market. Uh, it shows you, this um, chart shows you the changes in resident uh, employment uh, and by income level. So you can see that, you know, there has been net job losses in the uh, lower income uh, group compared to a net job gain in the mid to high income uh, group. So this suggests that, you know, low income uh, has been the one that bore the brunt. And if you consider the impact of this, the nature of this pandemic, uh, rightfully so, because, you know, the pandemic has actually hit many of the frontline positions, uh, frontline jobs. And these are also jobs that typically command lower uh, wages. So this, you know, makes the support measures on jobs all the more important. Indeed, the government has put forth very strong, robust fiscal response to this pandemic. If you look at slides 14 here, um, this is totally unprecedented. Um, we have never seen such robust uh, fiscal response uh, from the government uh, since, in fact, since independence. The government have put forth four separate stimulus packages, uh, considering the unity package, resilience package, solidarity package, and the fortitude package. In total, that's about 93 billion, which is about 19% of GDP. Deficit will hit a record of 74 billion, uh, which is about 15% of GDP. And also importantly, the government has drawn down about 52 billion from our reserve to fund 
all these uh, stimulus packages. And of course, beyond the uh, drawdown on the reserve, the government has also uh, utilized entirely the accumulated surplus from the past four financial years. Now, this is very important. Uh, why the need that the government, why the need to have such robust policy response to the pandemic? And you can see from slide 15 here, um, the y-axis shows the stringency index uh, and the x-axis shows the fiscal stimulus as a percent of GDP. Uh, and we compare that country to country. And you can see that in terms of level, C, level of stringency, um, Singapore's uh, circuit breaker uh, stringency is very comparable to countries such as Philippines, China, and India. But the main difference is this. Singapore's policy support is significantly larger compared to those countries. Now, why is that important? Because if the level of policy support is inadequate, then countries or the economy will be confronted with this dilemma you know, of um, life versus livelihood. Because if you impose sustained period of lockdown, then the impact, the economic pain that will be incurred will be very significant. And as a result, you will require you will be required to put forth very strong policy res, uh, support, but countries such as Philippines, China, and India, and Vietnam, they were not able to do so. All right, especially for countries like Philippines, China, and India, and if they are not able to come up with very strong policy support, that means the countries will be forced to reopen up the economy prematurely, and this basically runs the risk of confronting you know with a second wave of infection, and that's exactly you know, happening now uh, in countries like Philippines and India. As you can see from the chart 16 here, uh, if you look at the chart uh, on the left hand side, India right now uh, has the fourth highest number of uh, COVID-19 cases, um, you know, in the world. And but more importantly, if you look at the nature of the curve, the curve is steepening. In other words, you know, um, the number of daily cases is rising. And this is despite the fact that, you know, the government has imposed lockdown. And yet, as a result of the lack of policy support, the government has to open up the economy prematurely. So I think risk is that, you know, we will see uh, increasing uh, numbers of uh, transmissions over there uh, in India. Likewise, the same is also happening in Philippines and in Indonesia. If you look at the chart on the right hand side, both countries are showing a steepening of the curve, despite the fact that the government has lifted their lockdown. Now, finally, before I end it off, um, just want to touch on a little bit about inflation. Um, well, with the economy in recessions, uh, lack of demand pool inflationary pressure, um, and also the fact that oil prices have remained quite low and that the government has put forth a whole slew of policy support, which, is, which are aimed at lowering cost of living. So therefore, we expect inflation this year to register minus 0.7% and will remain in the negative level in the coming months as well. Then that's, that's slide 17. So now slide 18 shows you that basically, you know, with the economy in recession and that inflation, you know, expected to remain in negative level, the MAS will continue to maintain a very accommodative uh, monetary policy. It has eased the, the exchange policy uh, in what we call a two-in-one move in uh, late March, essentially shifting the uh, senior policy band to zero appreciation and also uh, introduce a one-off uh, downward recentering in the policy band. Now, with the senior, which is a red line, hovering now at the midpoint of the policy band, um, I think uh, it may suggest that, you know, uh, for now, uh, the MES is not looking at, you know, further uh, you know, adjustments in is uh, monetary policy. Uh, and, you know, uh, also, I think there is a wide recognition that fiscal policy could be more effective, you know, in such circumstances. So um, as of now, um, you know, I don't, I think there is just very, very marginal risk uh, that the uh, MES will uh, ease monetary policy further. But of course, this will be data dependent. If we start to see sharp deteriorations in the economic data, then of course it will could potentially prompt more actions by the central bank. So I've gone to the end of my presentation. Um, Tamer, back to you.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Irvin. Uh, very insightful. Let's start with the last slide that you just showed us with the MAS uh, monetary policy stance. Uh, of course, you know Singapore pursues monetary policy through its exchange rate. And where you see the Sing dollar hovering around now, both from a nominal effective perspective as well as a uh, bilateral against the U.S. dollar perspective, uh, do you think that is acting as a tailwind uh, for the economy? Is it neutral? Uh, could the currency a bit weaker be helpful or it is what it is and we just have to live with that? Well, I think we have to, I mean, to answer this question seriously, we have to look at the primary focus of the MAS. Now, the MAS you know, um, does not engage in competitive uh, you know, devaluations. Uh, and of course, Singapore is in the uh, you know currency manipulator watch list. So, um, I and and more importantly, seriously, I mean, uh, you know, uh, ensuring a competitive uh, exchange rate is not the prerogative of the uh, central bank. Um, I think what is more important for uh, MAS is to ensure price stability, uh, and calibrating its uh, exchange rate policy according to the outlook on inflation. So, as I mentioned just now. Um, that um, the, I mean, we, we will continue to see negative inflation. Since henceforth, you know, uh, the MAS will maintain an accommodative uh, monetary policy. So uh, if you talk about, you know, whether uh, a weaker sing dollar will be a tailwind for the Singapore economy, well, uh, perhaps, but the thing is that I think the key emphasis here is that, you know, that's not the uh, prerogative, prerogative of the MAS. You don't therefore expect the zero slope to become negative slope. No way. Singapore would not be able to, uh, and will never, uh, you know, uh, engineer a negative slope in the uh, senior policy band. Uh, partly, this is a, a result of, and I, I mean, just now I mentioned that some of the reason uh, because we are in the uh, in the watch list. And also, um, you know, there is really very little basis to switch to a negative uh, uh, slope, uh, a declining slope. And also there are structural reasons as well uh, because of the very high uh, saving rates in Singapore. Now in Singapore, we have what we call a CPF system, uh, Central Provident Fund Systems. Uh, essentially, um, all Singaporeans, uh, this is compulsory uh, saving systems. They have to set aside a certain share of their, um, you know, monthly income and to put into this uh, CPF account. So in other words, there is always a uh, liquidity uh, drain uh, from the uh, banking systems. So with these liquidity drains, which is always there happening all the time, um, therefore, this creates uh, appreciation bias on the sing dollar. So it's very difficult for the MAS, you know, nor is it their objective um, to switch to a negative slope or declining slopes for the senior policy band. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're out of policy options. The band can always be recentered in a lower level or the band can widen, be widened as well, right? Yeah, correct. So they can adopt a wider band. They can recenter it lower. Uh, but you know, to switch, switch to a, a downward slope, uh, sloping uh, policy band is very difficult. Uh, partly because, like I mentioned, because of the nature of the economy, the structural economy. Uh, but of course, this does not mean that they are they are short of uh, policy option. Because as you have rightfully pointed out, they can always widen the band or recenter it downward. More importantly, I think uh, our exchange policies is not meant for short-term counter-cyclical uh, purpose. It is more meant for medium-term uh, you know, uh, policy focus, policy target. Where, whereas for short-term counter-cyclical purpose, typically the government will utilize fiscal policy instead, which has what we have seen, um, you know, which is what we have seen so far um, you know, during this pandemic. The government rolled out four separate stimulus packages in four months and the quantums is um, unprecedented. Correct. Uh, what about the playbook that Western central banks are pursuing, you know, purchasing assets and doing a significant amount of coordination with the central government in terms of supporting the large issuances? Uh, are those at all in the playbook of MAS or Singapore being a AAA uh, borrower doesn't have to worry about these things? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we are triple A, uh, you know, rating country. Um, I don't think there's a need for the government to do so. And plus the fact that, um, you know, I think those policy options works best 
you know, when frankly speaking, when the uh, interest rate policy rates for those countries are always at, already at rock bottom level, and Singapore doesn't operate on an interest rate regime, uh, and also, you know, we are a very small uh, uh, economy and very open economy. Uh, and with a very strong uh, high level of capital flows in and out of the systems all the time. So I think if we were to adopt that kind of uh, policy options, um, it will be actually much less uh, effective compared to big domestically driven economy like, you know, uh, many of the uh, Western economy. The issue of, you know, being a price taker as far as interest rate is concerned because Singapore has an open capital account is something that, of course, the Singaporean markets fully understand. And given that there is this structurally uh, pronounced downward trend in the interest rate globally, uh, we have seen uh, in the US or Euro area, for example, rates steadily declined through the cycle over the last 20, 30 years. So we will also be stuck with very low interest rates in Singapore for years to come. <laughs> I, I think that is pretty much a given, uh, you know, because, uh, because, you know, of the fact that um, our interest rate is very closely correlated with the uh, global interest rate. And that yeah, if, we, if we do expect, you know, that central banks around the world to continue to maintain such, uh, you know, ultra low interest rate environment, then obviously that will imply the same for our domestic interest rate. And we have also already seen that uh, recently in terms of, you know, a sharp uh, drop in the cyborg, the saw and the Sora. So um, I think this will pro probably be the kind of uh, assumption that we can safely make, uh, you know, in the next uh, at least one or perhaps even two years to go to come. Um, and that, um, but that being said, uh, another reason is also because, you know, of the fact that um, Singapore has often been perceived as a safe haven. Uh, because of its triple A ratings, uh, you know, we are not seeing, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a flight to safety uh, or capital outflows. Uh, henceforth, in fact, we, are, we could be actually seeing, uh, or we are already seeing, you know, some sort of a capital inflows in Singapore. You know, as we picked up in other parts of the world, you know, uh, you know investors need a, a safe haven to park their funds. So, you know, that could essentially uh, depress the domestic you know, interest rate and continue to lend support for the Sing dollar. Right. Irvin, let's talk a little bit about fiscal policy, particularly with respect to the need for supporting the travel tourism industry, as well as the risk that there will be the new crop of unemployed people going forward because of the distress in that industry in particular. Um, are we more or less done with system-wide support and whatever support we see going forward from the fiscal side would be very targeted uh, maybe only aimed at sort of hospitality and travel sectors? Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, with the fact that, um, you know, the labor market uh, cycle will lag behind growth cycle. Uh, and the point that I highlighted just now that we haven't seen the worst from the labor market yet because of this so-called uh, support measures that the government has put in place, uh, you know, which has prevented further fall in the labor market. But when that expire, obviously, you know, some companies may have to let go of their workers. But the thing is that if the government were to continue uh, to put, you know, such broad based support measures, I think it is unsustainable as well. Um, industries like manufacturing and including even the FMB and, and retail sectors will likely see improvement. So therefore, it makes sense for the government to take a more uh, targeted approach going forward, especially when it comes to support for the labor market. So, um, in fact, I just had this discussion with uh, one of the uh, manpower ministers uh, just a few days ago on this point as well. Um, well, of course, um, you know, there's a lack of clarity with regards to how they are going to do it when it comes to, um, you know, the job support schemes. But I guess, you know, the consensus, uh, you know, that we had is that uh, there is a need for recalibrations, uh, and or more importantly, there could be a need to extend uh, some of these support measures because industry, uh, tourism industry, will take a long time uh, to recover back to pre-COVID level. So there could be a need to further support uh, jobs over there. But I think there's another important point that we also have to bear in mind that. Um, rather than to continue to subsidize jobs, 
the government now is looking at creating jobs. So because some of the jobs will be lost permanently, it doesn't make sense to continue to subsidize those jobs. So um, the government have put forth in the latest 42 package, uh, you know, if in what we call, uh, you know, the SG United uh, Skills and Jobs Program, whereby the government hope to create uh, up to 100,000 new jobs, new traineeship uh, positions, as well as skills training, uh, hopefully to help those affected workers take on new jobs and then uh, to continue to be uh, employed. I think that is a very important uh, policy trust because rather than to continue to subsidize jobs that could be lost permanently, now the focus is really about creating new jobs in other industries that offer better prospects. This is a very big pivot, if you will, because we have had in train a lot of long-term infrastructure projects, whether it is Terminal 5 at Changi Airport or the uh, train line to Malaysia um, or development of the next uh, downtown in the Tanjung Pagar port area. All of these things are going to get delayed. Do you worry that Singapore's potential GDP growth rate is going to take a downshift because of all this? Well, I think if we do see a downshift um, in growth uh, on a medium term basis, because in the near term, you know, we could actually benefit from this year's low base. And, you know, it is an aromatic uh, effect that could see, uh, you know, higher than usual growth in the next one to two years. If assuming that we don't get weighted down by uh, the pandemic uh, and that we get a vaccines probably uh, hopefully uh, next year uh, and things will to resume to norm. But if you are referring to uh, specifically on the uh, built industry or the construction industries, as well as the, the uh, you know, the multiplier effect from the infrastructure projects, then obviously I think uh, it is safe to assume that there will be delay um, and that this could have, uh, you know, some drags on the overall GDP growth performance. Um, but I think more importantly, we need to think focus on long term because I think for the construction sector, um, we have suffered from you know, I think the pandemic, in fact, has laid bare this over-reliance on foreign workers in this particular industry Correct. Um, to the point whereby companies somehow, you know, has been complacent and there haven't been enough investment into technology or better or more productive uh, business processes. So henceforth, you know, because of the availability of abundance of low-wage uh, foreign workers. So this essentially... Uh, resulted in uh, you know lower significantly lower than usual kind of productivity growth in the construction industry and this has to change and i think the pandemic has prompted you know a hard uh, rethink about the uh, business model for this particular industry so if you focus on the long term i think the pandemic could uh, you know catalyst some um, positive structural change in the construction industry going forward one would certainly hope so. Uh, Urban, we are recording this on the 2nd of July, eight days to go before the elections. Uh, mm -hmm. What are you expecting? Uh, we've had elections that have gone very strongly in favor of the incumbent party in the past, and we've had elections where it hasn't gone so well. Uh, given where we stand in the cycle, what's your expectation? Well, um, first and foremost, uh, if you consider the fact that we are currently uh, you know, undergoing the worst crisis since independence. Um, and there will be significant repercussion on the labor market. Livelihoods are at stake. This will be a very crucial elections uh, whereby Singaporeans have to choose, you know, the right party uh, to not only lead them out of this pandemic, but to carve out the future for the next generation going forward. Well, um, I think the ruling party has done, you know, a great job, uh, you know, uh, over the years and particularly during this pandemic. I think the voters will also recognize that. Um, but this is going to be a very interesting election because we are also uh, seeing, you know, uh, you know, some very new, interesting, uh, incredible new faces coming from the opposition party. So I think it will be a tough choice. For some voters, particularly in in those constituencies that will be hotly contested, um, and uh, but I believe that uh, at the end of the day, um, if what we can achieve from this election 
is that we can bring about uh, you know, better policy that will benefit Singapore and Singaporeans and the next generation as well. Then whatever the outcome, uh, it will be a good election. So I think that is what I think Singaporeans voters should aim for. Um, you know, we don't should we shouldn't just basically you know follow the footsteps of some countries whereby we change for the sake of changing. I mean, we need to change if you know if we think that all and we are sure that there will be a better outcomes going forward. That's right, indeed. Um, so that's a good note to end this discussion on. Uh, Irvin, thank you very much for your time and insights. Welcome. Uh, thanks to our listeners for listening in. This has been another episode of the Asia Economist webinar. You can find all our research and multimedia by Googling DBS Research Library. Thank you.